Bible. There's uh, Bibles back on the bookshelf. 
sheets, extra sheets back there by Bob, uh, and uh, to help yourself. Uh, for those of you joining us online, everything you need is on the website um, on uh, faithinjeffcity.org, and uh, there's a Bible study uh, sheet there for the class. And uh, you can always, by the way, for those of you here, as well as those online, can always watch past weeks of Bible classes if you want. It's always on Facebook and things like that. Um, people have told me they're good if you can't sleep at night. Uh, you <laughs> just assume that that means they'd rather study the Bible instead of sleep. I don't think there's any other reason for that. Uh, anyhow, so uh, we celebrate being together as church today um, by being able to study his word. What a blessing. Uh, it is such a blessing to be able to come together and dig into his word and, and seek out what he may have us learn today. And, and uh, you know, it, it, I think every time we open the Bible, there's a chance for us to be shaped. That's really God's plan. Um, it's not just once in a while. His, his intention is every time we read the word of God, every time we come together in that sanctuary up there, every time at home that you open up and read and reflect on the Bible, it's meant to chip away. Uh, some of those rough edges and, and smooth out and shape us in some way. So I pray today uh, is an, a great opportunity to do that. So we are on number four for the lack of a, just to keep some order to it, not that it really matters all that much, uh, but we are on the fourth week or fifth week, at, fourth week, um, oh, fifth week, we did two on the introduction. Anyhow, looking at the red words of Jesus, and, and when I say red words, it's the words that Jesus has been noted as to have spoken. These are not the only words that Jesus has spoken. They're the only ones that got written down, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, when, you, when you get to learning about uh, Martin Luther, you find that Martin Luther in his later days was really frustrated that people would follow him around and write down everything he said. Because he just got notable for going, oh, it says wise things and theological and doctrinally relevant things. And he's like, sometimes I just, and he actually said this, sometimes I just want to use the restroom. <laughs> and they wrote that down. <laughs> That's deep. You know, I don't know if it's deep. It's a restroom. I don't care, you know. But it, it, it gets the point. In fact, John even says in the Gospel of John, so many other things were done by Jesus, so many other miraculous signs. They're not all written down here. If they were, it couldn't be contained and, and so forth. So the things that we have are the things that we have. And this is where the work of the Holy Spirit says, I want you to know this and this and this. So we have everything we need, but we don't have everything there is. Does that make sense? Okay, right? So as we look at these red letters of Jesus, that's what we're looking at. So we're kind of working our way through this list, right? The being with Jesus words where he invites us to be with him, whether it's through prayer, worship, meditation, um, you know, uh, prayer and, and things like that. Uh, different things, the, the ways for us to be with him. With forgiving God's words through Jesus, um, words of forgiveness, whether it's his words forgiving us, his command for us to forgive others. We talked a little bit about that uh, before. And now we work our way into words that Jesus has called us to serve. Um, now, I want you to know that uh, this book that I've kind of been using as a, a structure for this from uh, Pastor Zach Zender, uh, it, it's called the, uh, the Red Letter Challenge. And we've kind of grown it into this Red Letter Living. It's a 40-day challenge, and if you want to purchase it, that's what it is, Red Letter Challenge. The words of Jesus are, are uh, scattered throughout the Gospels. But the way that we have arranged them for the sake of this class and actually for the sake of that book as well is that one kind of feeds into the next. And the reason I say that is serving is not often the first thing when I'm talking to somebody about Jesus that I'll necessarily talk about because they get a, a kind of a warped sense of so to be a Christian, you have to do something. You have to do something in order to be a Christian. What I want us to understand is that when you are called to be with Jesus and then you come to understand what grace is, now what do you want to do? Not what do you have to do? Otherwise, serving would be first. And we would say, in order for you to be a believer and be in heaven one day, there's a list of things you have to do, right? Most other religions, I can say, you know, almost without exception, has a list of to-dos, right? In the Muslim faith, 
There are the five pillars. You have to do the five pillars. It has to do with, you know, giving alms, traveling to Mecca, um, you know, uh, uh, praying in a certain direction X number of times a day. You have to do those things in order to appease Allah. Buddhism, the sevenfold path, Hinduism, um, and, and even, even Catholicism has some works righteousness wired into it. The difference for Christianity, biblically speaking, is that Jesus doesn't require anything of us in order to be saved. It's surrender. Do you trust that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he has paid the price for all your sins? Not most of your sins. Not only if you're a good person, right? He has died for all sins of all people of all time, right? And so now, what do you want? to do. All right. So that with that kind of idea, I want to kind of climb into that. One of the words um, of Jesus, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Right. Uh, when you think about that, that's pretty blunt. Right. I, I, uh, I really would resist standing before the almighty and have him ask me that question. Do you love me? Right. With with that in mind, because I would say I didn't do very well. I did not keep your commands. In fact, there's times I dodged them, right? When you said, do you love your neighbor? Ugh, not enough. Not often, right? You pray for your, those that persecute you. Hardly ever, right? Um, do you forgive like I forgive? Not even close, right? And yet, what does he say? His, some of his red words. If you love me, follow these words. And, and we go, well, I fail miserably. Now, we shouldn't fail miserably and give up. We fail miserably and recommit. Right. Just just like I often told my kids when I was raising them and still to some degree now, I kind of go learn. That was one of those words I just said often. Right. Learn. And they're like, oh, I did this mistake. This happened. You know, this happened at work. This happened at school, whatever. And I'm like, learn, learn from it. Right. Take the experience of life and learn from it. I imagine that God wants to do the same thing. Right. If, if there's a consequence for this, how about this? Learn from it. Learn from it. So you don't keep doing the same thing. Kind of silly to sit there and whack your thumb with a hammer and go, man, that really hurt. And then hit it again. Right? You kind of sit there and kind of go, you, you're not all that bright. Okay? Instead, why don't you learn? Move your thumb out of the way. Try hitting something other than your thumb. Okay? And you kind of go, learn. Okay? So God says, if you love me, keep my commands. And he says, keep working in that direction. So let's jump in. Um, now, now the, the question of here uh, of why do I serve, and it's there on your uh, on your sheet there, um, would you open up to John 14, 15, please? John 14, 15. John 14, 15. Gospel of John. And, and really, we're going to ask that question as we begin. Why do we serve? Because that's really a, a pretty important question for us. If I, if I go back to this list, right, of things, it seems like in a... In a overview, you could go, oh, I have to, I'm supposed to, and so forth. So let's see why. Um, John 14, 15, who has it? What? Oh, it's, duh, sorry. <laughs> Can I tell you it's been a long weekend already? I apologize. Yeah, I was thinking why that's there, and I'm like, that's really familiar, like I reviewed this. So you've already got it there. On John 14, 15. You were so nice, David. You didn't just read it again. And I appreciate it. You're so kind. Right? Why do we serve? We serve because we love God. Right? We serve because we love. We serve because it's a response. Right? When I think of how I, I love my wife or I love my kids or I serve my kids and my wife, um, you should do that because of a relational connection, not just because you have to. Because have tos, you'll come up with excuses, won't you? Right. Uh, if you think about it, uh, you, I use this example a lot. Driving the speed limit. Right. Most of us don't drive the speed limit because we love to. Right. We don't. I, I think we do it because we have to. And so that tends to cause us to fudge a little bit on the speed limit. We have justifications. We have rationalizations. I was in a hurry. I had to use the restroom. Nobody's around. It's the roads are wide open. What we make all these excuses. I always laugh when people kind of say, oh, you can always go like four or five miles over the speed. What, don't we have a number? 
in your own head, right? Some people are holding up fingers, right? Some of you are putting up two hands, right? The point is, is that we, we make these rationalizations, but you and I, we serve people, I hope, out of love. Because if we do out of obligation, there's limits to it. We'll, we'll, we'll make conditions. I'll serve you as long as you serve me, right? I'll serve you and then you owe me. Well, that's not love, right? That's not unconditional. Instead, we go, I'll serve you, why? Just because I love you. And, and I want something good for you and, and so forth. So um, what, I, what I want, if you keep my commands, do you know how many times as a dad I've used the phrase because I said so, right? As a mom, you've said it, right? As a grandparent, I bet you've said it. Um, maybe as a boss or a manager, a supervisor, you've said it. We say that often. God says that. It's actually what he's saying here. If you love me, keep my commands. Why? Because I said so. See these red words? I said so. I'm the God of the universe. God of the universe doesn't bend down and negotiate with us. He usually bends down and goes, boink, right? And kind of goes, because I said so. Because it's best for you. Because it's right, right? Uh, and, and so forth. So you and I, we say things like that, and yet we have to understand God speaks those red words as well. Why should I love my neighbor? Not because your neighbor deserves it. Not because it builds you up, not because it'll earn you points. None of that. None of that's in Scripture. In fact, he doesn't ever explain it. He just says, do it. Well, why do we have to do it then? Because he said so. Right? You, you see where that puts you? It puts you in a submissive role to God. Do you know why a, a man is to, to marry a woman and not a man and a man or a woman and a woman? Do you know why? Because God said so. Do you know how easy that conversation is with someone? Because then what we end up doing is people, we end up arguing. Well, we got to be fruitful and multiply. You can't be fruitful if we have two men or two women or, or whatever and, and so forth. So that, that's why. Mm -mm. That, that, that might be some rationale you can use uh, to, to discuss it. But you know why? God said so. Do you know why one man to only one woman, not many women, or one woman and many men? Because God said so. Do you know why you care for your children? Not because they deserve it. Right? But because God said so. Do you know why you honor those in authority? Not because they're honorable. Not because they're good at what they do all the time. But because God said so. Do you know why we don't speak evil toward one another? Or why we don't, you know, steal things or covet and all those things we've talked about? Because God said so. He's in charge. Guys, this gets you out of so many problems of discussion and argument in the world. Because the world wants to argue, wants to be that little kid that sits there and goes, tell me why. Four-year-olds, do you know how many times they would use the word why? 18,000 times a day, right? Why? Tell me why. I want to understand why. Do you know how many times? That's why we as parents came up with that phrase, because I said so. And they're like, but that doesn't answer my question. And actually, it does, right? It does answer it. Okay, so, so why do we serve? Being compelled by grace and love, we serve. Being compelled. Right? So something comes before the serving, right? Not why do we serve because we have to or because we earn points, right? That one day you're going to be up in heaven and you're going to go, oh, this is a much bigger cloud than I was going to get because I served so much, right? Look at the size of this harp compared to that guy over there or that gal over there that didn't serve a lot. Look at this is all the results of my serving, okay? Um, instead, we said we are being compelled by something that was already given to us, right? Um, I've, I've used this example too. I only have, you guys realize, I only have 12 stories, right? And I, and I just use them inter 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 interchangeably, right? Gal at my last church in Pawpaw, she got a liver tra uh, kidney transplant uh, shortly, after, or shortly before I arrived there. And, uh, and, and as a result, you can understand a person that gets a, a, a transplant probably uh, had a shorter lifespan expectancy because of it, right? Um, she was, she was going to lose both of her kidneys. Both of them were failing. And she got a kidney transplant from a gal she did not know, uh, got on the transplant list. This gal got uh, uh, charted and, and discovered that she was compatible and got this. And then, of course, goes through all of the changes of dealing with, you know, try not to reject it and all the drugs and things like that, and, and yet she continues to live and, and, uh, and, and be blessed by this. When I talked to her um, about her transplant and about that process, do you know how thankful she was? 
right? Because she really understood what that transplant meant to her, right? Without it, I'll die. She had she had three children and, and a husband and a, and, a, uh, and a normal life. And she goes, all of that would have been gone. But because this woman selflessly gives up one of her healthy kidneys to me, I now have a life. And she goes, every day I wake up, I'm reminded of that gift. Guys, grace is heaven for us one day, right? Every day we should wake up with that knowledge and go, how do I want to live now? Do you want to live as if you have been given a new lease on life? And I mean, eternity speaking, or do you just kind of go, eh, right? That's how we should be compelled by that grace and love. Let's keep going. Doing what God commands is actually living the life that we're made for. Do you understand that we live in a fallen state, right? This world is broken. I, I don't know if you guys knew that. Did you know that? The world is broken. It is imperfect. Your body doesn't work the way you want it to, okay? In fact, I could demonstrate that. Just ask everybody to stand up and see how much noise you make. You realize I don't sit down in church. That's why. I'm afraid I'll be mic'd and you'll hear this. Ugh, right? I'm starting to make those noises more, right? Or when I get up out of bed, I sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies, right? Snap, crackle, and pop. The idea is that you and I are built, right, to be an infusion of God to this world. We're meant for it. That's why God has uh, uh, resided here in our hearts. The reason he's there, he's like, I want to use you, your hands, your feet, your mouth, your eyes, uh, and so forth, to be able to profess God's goodness and his love to a world that needs to hear it. I want to use you. We are naturally produced for this. Okay, I've shared this with you. You and I cannot be here in this room, I believe, any more saved than we are. Right? I believe that if, if right now, as weird as that would be, God suddenly called every single one of us home, I believe we'd go home to heaven. Right? I believe you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'd be in heaven. So the question becomes, why are we still here? That's it. It's not so God can say, well, I want to get you super saved. Right? Or I want to really anchor it in and, and so forth. He said, no, no, you're saved. Now I want to plan on using you so that others can come to know. Right? The commission, the great commission. That's why. Okay? And so as we see this. Now, so uh, why do we see serve? Uh, here's what I want you to see. So go to um, 1 John, please. 1 John 4.19, not the Gospel of John. I don't think I put this one up on the screen. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we love because he first loved us. Boy, that's a beautiful verse. Right? Right? We love, why? Again, compelled by something else. I shared this, um, I see Pat back there. Uh, I shared this with Megan and Stefan yesterday in the wedding. Um, I was talking to them about uh, the, uh, the, the vow that we give in, uh, in marriage is kind of my little homily during the wedding. And, uh, and I was telling them, I said, you cannot give uh, what you do not have. Right? You cannot love people until you have received love. And I don't mean love Hallmark love. Nice glittery red heart, you know, a little arrow through it and so forth. I mean the love that comes from above. You cannot give love until you receive love. That's why, by the way, make this full circle, that when Jesus said, when, they, when he's asked by an expert of the law, which is the most important commandment, he says, love God with everything that you are, I'm summarizing, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know how you love your neighbor? You get this right. Get this relationship with God right. And it doesn't mean just like I'm, I'm happy with him and he's happy with me. It means line up this relationship between you and God. That, that love will flow down to you through Jesus Christ and then exudes everywhere else. The reason I can love my wife, right, even though she is very lovable, right, the way I can love her is because of God's love through me. If it were me, it'd be really kind of haphazard and, and sporadic and random and so forth because I'm broken and sinful. Instead, God's love comes down and goes out. You know how I can love you guys? All of you? God's love, right? You know how you can love me? Please? God's love. You know how you can love total strangers? God's love, right? It's not just kind of like, well, I've I, I, I judge it or I gauge it or, or whatever else. It is God's love flowing through us. Okay, so God loved us first. And so we're, I love this word, overwhelmed and we respond. I really, I wish that, um, I wish that was a word 
that we thought of more often in worship. I wish we were overwhelmed more, right? I wish when we came together as church that we were overwhelmed, right? That sometimes that there's, there's a, a line in a hymn or a scripture reading or something that's said in a prayer or maybe a sermon or, or something like that, and you are just overwhelmed by the love and presence of God, and then you just go, oh, here it comes, right? I just got to respond. When we were in church in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, there was, a, there was a young family, and uh, we, we just saw them on, on uh, Facebook not too long ago. The kids have all grown up. But they were two little kids, uh, roughly the same age. And the girl, the little girl, she was probably three, uh, maybe four years old. And uh, in service, she would go out into the aisle, and she would twirl during the music with her dress. It's a great big fanned out sanctuary, so there's several aisles, not just like one aisle for us. And she'd always sit with her kids way over on the side because she goes, I don't want it to be a distraction. I can tell you as the pastor, when I would be up there and the, the hymn is going and I'm just watching this girl dance around and I'm just thinking, we should all do this, right? Now, most of us don't wear dresses, <laughs> right? But to have that kind of overflowing, being overwhelmed, I, I don't think she had deep theology going on in her head, but I knew that she just loved God. Right? And just says, I just want to respond. When David, King David, danced in the prayer shawl before the Lord with great might. When you dance with great might, you do not care who else sees you. In fact, his wife, if you remember, her name was Michael. It was pronounced Michael. Is up in the, the palace and looks down. She goes, what a shameful thing the king is doing. And he's like, I don't care. I'm dancing in front of the Lord. Right? I am overwhelmed. I'm overjoyed by who he is and, and to be able to respond to that. That's why we serve. We serve because we're like, I can't believe that God has done this to me right? and done this for me and tends to do this through me. Of course I want to do this. Not because I think there's any benefit for me or my own salvation, but there is a benefit for them, my neighbor. Right? We've talked about this, right? of how God has used us or uses us to be able to benefit our neighbor. All right. James 2, 26, please. Somebody have that. For as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Oh, this was, uh, this was a struggle for good old Martin Luther. Uh, now, culturally, and I mean that in his context of his world in the 1500s, um, he was kind of, he was leery of James uh, because James was blunt. And, and James, right there at that verse, gets really close to works righteousness, right? Faith without works is dead. What he's really saying is, if you have faith and it doesn't have an impact on the people around you, something is missing, right? And, and I mean seriously missing, not just new and improved faith, but if you have faith knowing that God has come in the form of Jesus, saved the sins of all people, and without him, those that believe will go to heaven, those that do not will go to hell and you will do nothing to change that in anyone's life and, and affect it, there's something wrong with faith, right? That's, that's really what James is saying. And Luther is like, well, be real careful. We're tiptoeing over, tip over that line. But it, it's not because what he's basically saying is this, actions matter. You and I are called to serve. We're called to be examples, ambassadors. It doesn't mean that we are undercover Christians, Right? That we have some secret, you know, I'll, I'll draw the little arc on the, on the sand and then you come over and draw the other arc. We're like, look, it makes the form of a fish. We're both Christian. Right? Don't tell anybody. Okay? Not at all. It, everyone ought to know. Right? And I don't mean in an obnoxious way, but everybody ought to know you're a believer in Jesus. And, and there might be a lot of people that know that you're a believer in Jesus that don't care and don't like it. But they should know. Right? Um, I shared this, uh, uh, Greg Finke's book, um, Joining Jesus on the Mission. He uses this story, and I think it's his, so I'll give him credit for it. Um, if you live next door to somebody, and you are, a, I used this example in class a long time ago, if you're a, a, a used minivan salesman, that's your job, right? And every time your neighbor comes out of the house, you ask him if he wants to buy a minivan. Every time you see him. You want to buy a minivan today? No, thanks. I appreciate it, but uh, thanks for asking. Every time you see him. You ask them if they want to buy a minivan, okay? Now, when the time comes and your neighbor is in the market for a minivan, who do you think he's going to talk to? He's going to talk to you probably because he goes, I know you sell minivans. 
Okay? Now, I don't mean to be obnoxious. doesn't mean you go knocking on their door. Hey, anybody in there want a minivan? Okay? The same thing is true of Jesus. Right? We, we can become obnoxious with the delivery of the gospel and so forth. Or we can just make sure that people around us, you all know that I love Jesus. You all know that Jesus changed my life and it can change yours. Right? I just want you to know that. And I'm going to tell you every time. Right? I'm going to remind you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate that. So when the time comes where God is knocking on your heart, who do you come talk to? Somebody who has been kind of planting those seeds and helping and, and guiding and directing all along. Actions matter. B-Y-S-S-I-W. Here's what it means. Because you said so, I will. Because you, that's God, Jesus, the red letters, because you said so, I will. What that's taken from is actually where the, um, you remember the disciples? Jesus shows up. Have you caught anything this morning? We've been out all night. And we haven't caught a thing, nothing. We are lousy fishermen. I can identify with that, right? And so what does Jesus tell them? Throw the net on the other side. Do you understand how water works? Right? Like, it, it's, it's not like they're in two streams and they're standing in the mud in the middle or something like that. Like, hey, there's no fish in that stream, but there is fish in this stream. Just throw it on that side. No, throw it over. That water is the same water you've been fishing out lately and so forth, and, and you caught nothing. Okay? And uh, throws it over, and they catch so many they can hardly even pull it in. Okay? And what does Peter say? Because you said so, I will. Not because it makes sense. Not because they're like, hey, this Jesus is quite the fisherman. He knows his stuff, right? You ever fish with somebody who's really superstitious? I have. It's weird, right? They're like, no, 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 before you do it, here, turn around twice, <laughs> right? And then tie the knot this way, and then and every time you'll catch something. You're like, come on. And then sure enough, you reel one in and go, you creep me out, you know? <laughs> the point is, is that Jesus just simply says so. Throw the net on the other side. They could have said, but why? It's the same water, Jesus, right? And, and they did, But because you said so, I will. That's how we approach it. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Mark 9, 35. It's on the screen. Don't look it up. <laughs> Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, I share this because this is countercultural. Jesus really turns the apple cart over, uh, and this is a challenge for us. And yet, because it's countercultural, it's notable, right? When you see someone really serving, and I don't mean serving to get the glory. That's, that's not usually a good thing because it distracts people to the point of why we serve. Um, that's why God's word says, you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You don't do it and go, look at me, look what I'm doing. Okay? I always kind of resist that you know, when, you're, when you're doing some kind of service that we draw attention to ourselves. It's always, a, it's always a risk because then people can get distracted and go, it's really about you or is it about something bigger, you know, more, more appropriate? But Jesus' counter culture is let the first be last and the last be first. Act that way. Put yourself last. Jesus on the... Uh, at the Last Supper, what did he do for his disciples other than institute the Lord's Supper? Wash their feet. Wash their feet. And, and what did Peter say when Jesus came to him and said, I'm going to wash your feet? Can't do it. I won't let you do it. Right? He said, because this is so countercultural. You can't. You're the rabbi. In fact, I'm pretty sure you're more than that. I've seen things. And, and if you're going to wash my feet, that's what a servant does. That's the lowest of the low. We appreciate them but it's not something a rabbi would do or ever do in that respect. And so then what does Jesus tell him? If you don't let me do this, you can have no part of me, whatever. And so what does Peter then say? Wash my whole body then. He's like, you're missing the point, Pete, right? I don't know if he called him Pete. Maybe he did. I would have, right? All right, Philippians 2, please. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God exalts the one who serves. It's Jesus, right? So what you find is that the one doing the serving are often the ones blessed for sure. I think the ones that receive the service are also blessed, but they're still somewhat in the dark, right? If you happen to give um, a homeless person a cold drink of water, they don't necessarily know Jesus as a result of that. Maybe it opens up the possibility, maybe it opens up a conversation, but you, the one giving the water, motivated by God's grace and mercy, you do know about God's grace. And so when you give that glass of water, when you help, that blesses you because you're like, now I'm being useful from God to be able to impact this person or this life or this situation. So it does bless you. I'd like it to bless the other person, but for sure it blesses you because you are responding, you are compelled by God's grace and mercy to do this service. Right? So it does help you. Now, I don't, I don't mean to tell you that this is some kind of spiritual investment process, right? That if you just serve, you'll get blessed, right? That's not why we do things, not if you understand Jesus. But the blessings will come, and that's good. You get built up. You ever notice that when you serve, it's easier to serve then? You, you kind of cross that line, and you're like, that wasn't all that hard, Right? I went and raked my neighbor's lawn and so everything like that felt really good. And I don't mean pridefully, but you're just kind of like it felt useful. I felt like I was helpful. I was able to do something kind uh, and so forth. And God gets the glory for that and, and so forth. And you're like, I could go do that again. I go do it somewhere else. It was easier. Why? Because I because I grew a little, I matured a little, I I I strengthened a little bit. Um, Luke 14, let me just read this. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. There's the payback, right? But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. You'll be blessed because you're doing what God has called you to do. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. It's not why we do it. But when you anchor yourself, lining yourself up with what God calls you to do, then you are lifting him up as Lord. You are trusting him with your life and your resources. And the result of that is simply being with him in eternity. It isn't a works righteousness process. The reason that you are inviting these people is because God says to. Not because if you do this, God will be happy and he'll swing open the door. One comes before the other. Okay, that's what I want you to be careful of understanding. It is not serving so that salvation comes. It is salvation comes free, grace, 100% a gift. Therefore, we are compelled. We want to serve. Um, who is God calling you to serve? I want you just to think about that. Who God, who God brings to mind? Maybe you can put uh, initials down on your paper if you think about it. That there's somebody that kind of perks up in your mind right now that you're like, God is, is moving and has been nagging me to be able to reach out and, and love on this person, to serve, to provide for something in this person. You serve without expecting rewards. That's what Luke 14 is highlighting. And in fact, our reward ultimately from Luke 14 is heaven. And so the question is, can we be patient? Um, it doesn't mean we're in a hurry to get to heaven, but it also means we want shortcuts, right? If I serve, I'd like some benefits now. Why should I wait to heaven one day? What a silly thing to say, right? But that's kind of motivates us, right? We're like, well, I'll serve somebody, but where's mine, right? If I serve this person, what if, what if they serve me back? That's kind of what I want, right? I invite them to over for dinner and then they invite me over for dinner and, and I borrow their lawnmower and they borrow my lawnmower and, and things like that. We kind of have this relationship. And then what God says, he says, I want you to take care of people that can't repay you. He said, your reward will be in heaven. And you're like, can I have something sooner? And he's like, to take place of heaven? 
right? So you'd like something instead of heaven right now, you'd like something good and, and wonderful and, and so forth. And, and I imagine God just scratches his head, right? It, it's, if our promise is heaven, that's all we need. We don't need anything else. There's nothing additional that you and I need. And so we got to stop chasing after the things in this world. I'll serve, I'll help, I'll give as long as dot, 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 there's something in it for me. Well, first of all, that's not serving, right? That's not giving. That's not selfless. That's not generous. That's not sacrificial. That's just, it's just negotiation, right? And instead, what God says, he says, what I want you to understand is that you can do this knowing, trusting, believing that heaven is in your future. And, and when we get to heaven, none of us are going to sit there and go, I wish I had more stuff. I wish I had more people that owed me. I wish I called in more markers, right? Um, and so like, none of us are going to say that. We are just going to fall to our knees and go, I cannot believe we're here. And I don't mean we cannot believe. I mean, we're just surprised and in awe. Right? I hope you will believe that you're there. <laughs> Otherwise, we have a problem. Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. Would somebody look that up, please? We serve because we want to be more like Jesus. But somebody give me Romans 5.8, please. But God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So look who we want to be. We want to be like Jesus. So while we are sinners, and you and I are, right? We want to be like him. I want to give glory to him. So don't, don't worry about our own brokenness and our own failings and things like that. Serve where you are. Serve how you are. Serve in the way that you can. Um, and, and don't try to be different. Try to be more than you are. Simply let God use you. And you'll find that God will start to alter your heart. Start to change how your mind works and what you think about, what your heart longs after and, and so forth. It will change you, but, but don't think that I have to be changed in order to serve. I think some of the, the most impressive things, I've seen these videos, maybe you guys have seen them around, where someone gives a, a person that is uh, very needy, homeless, whatever, and uh, they give them a, a bunch of money, right, a $100 bill or something like that, and then they kind of follow them secretly with a camera. I don't know if you've ever seen these little videos, and you watch what they do with it. A lot of times they go and they share it with other homeless people, right? And you see that there's other people in their community that are in need and they go and they buy things and they buy things and they distribute them to other people. And you're like, whoa, you know, you, you would think that you'll just take whatever resources you can and hoard it and, and take it and try to live as long as you can on it. You find that they, they find that themselves being very generous, and you're like, wow, how, how could we learn from that? I, I hold on to all my stuff. And you kind of go, what little I give, they, they share and they distribute. What, a, what an example that is. Be more like Jesus. Matthew 22, 39. Uh, I'll just give you this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, that means anyone you and I contact is your neighbor. Anyone you contact. Not just the people that live next door. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Um, because this is, uh, this is a kind of a statement on our times. I, I'm, I'm guessing that there is an age break off on this somewhere. So let me explain. The older you are, I think the more likely you are to know your neighbors. I don't know if that's true across the board. Maybe it's this. The longer you lived in a place, the more likely you are to know your neighbors. I find that people don't want to be outside as much anymore. Right? I find that most people don't like to, to sit outside, talk over the, the driveway or come over and borrow stuff and things like that. There, there's people that I just wave at. And I'm kind of like, I've, I've, hey, and then off they go. I think partly because they know I'm a pastor, but I, I think that's, <laughs> they're kind of like, don't talk to him. He'll invite you to church or something, right? <laughs> they're right. They're right. <laughs> But it, it's, it's interesting to me that we don't have those relationships like we once did. But, but that's the problem when we think of our neighbors as only those people that geographically are, are, have a proximity to us. I, I want you to know every person you come in contact with throughout the day, God considers your neighbor. So when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, think if that framed all of your interactions today, just today. Take it and, and let that frame everything. If you go to the store today, and, and you're in the checkout line and there's people around you. Guess what? Every one of those people is your neighbor. Person checking out, assuming you're not doing a self-checkout at Walmart, right, is your neighbor, right? Those people in the cars next to you, behind you, in front of you, your neighbors, right, uh, and, and so forth. Your family members, neighbors, 
right? People here at church, neighbors, all of them. And, and think about that. If it says love your neighbor as yourself, think of how that will frame uh, this life. God looked upon us and thought they need my help. Um, as we think about our interaction with this world. So God came. I, I, I'm, always, I'm always baffled by that, that Jesus came to live among us for 33 years. You ever think about that? That Jesus came to live with us on earth for 33 years. You realize he didn't need 33 years to accomplish salvation. Right? And he didn't spend those 30 years getting ready for salvation. Right? He wasn't just sitting there kind of going, okay, here we go. I'm going to get ready to start teaching and doing miracles and, and uh, you know, carrying that cross and loving people and things like that. He lived around us and be with us to be a neighbor. I mean, when you think about it, think about what he did. Left heaven, his house, came down here and lived here. Lived in flesh. That must have been miserable. Not, not that God can feel misery necessarily in that same way. But I, I just think of what that must have been like to say, I have to take on human flesh. It's broken, right? It's frail. Uh, it's, it's weak. And, and, and I'm God. And just what a, what a polar res responsibility he took as Savior. And yet he did it because he wanted to come down here and be with us, neighbors with us, love us, uh, and care for us. Matthew uh, 19, 14 here, it says this, Let the little child, children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs, or the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When we talk of serving, we got to remember that includes children in serving. Not only serving children, but in serving. We, we shouldn't wait till they graduate someday, right? I, I, um, I used to do youth ministry quite a bit. Many of you know that I was a teacher, then I was in youth ministry. And, and uh, one of the things I, I used to kind of um, try to reteach or reframe for people when they would say, it, they'd look at our children, they'd look at our teenagers, and they would say, they are the church of tomorrow, right? It's not true. They're the church today, right? If they have given faith, and that happens in the waters of baptism, by the way. So last Sunday, little Addison Munson, um, uh, just a handful of months old, she has faith right now. Can't really express it too well. Okay, can't say much, but she has faith. Saving faith, right? And that faith is now meant to be exercised. Now, I'm not suggesting that you take little Addison and put a rake in her hand and kind of go, could you go over to your next door neighbors and start raking? Okay, but the fact of the matter is, is you are capable because of the presence of a spirit within you to serve at any age. In whatever form. That's why we should get our children involved in serving soon. So that they can be mobilized. So they can be funneled with that presence of God through them to say, I want you to grow and mature in service. And the only way to do that is to serve. One of the things we did back in St. Louis, I love this activity. We used to go and rake leaves in the fall. And we just called it the big rake. And uh, the big rake, it was kind of cool because uh, what we did, was the, it was the brainchild of our, our uh, senior pastor, uh, Pastor Christensen. And uh, we'd all show up on that Sunday in blue jeans and t-shirts, right? Actually, we had kind of t-shirts that, uh, uh, what did they say? I serve, kind of like an iPhone or an iPad, little I and a big S, I serve. And, uh, and there were these shirts and, and we all just mobilized after one service, packed into the sanctuary, all went into the gym, ate hot dogs and, and baked beans and so forth. And then we all split up and went to these places where we had a list of, 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 of lawns that we were going to rake. So elderly people, military families, sick folks, um, just next door neighbors to the church. And we just went out into the community and worked for like four hours. What I loved about that is we had all these kids, right, going with us, which was a riot. Um, now, Kids are not the most effective rakers. And the attraction of a pile of leaves is really hard to beat, okay? And they would, you know, you got this long stick of a rake and they're grabbing on down here and just, you know, raking away and you're like, God bless them. They're seeing it, right? And they get to see the joy of the people that serve and, and things like that. And it's an opportunity to get children involved and engaged. I've appreciated talking to both Megan uh, and Michelle leading our youth here of finding regular opportunities to serve because it grows you, right? It strengthens you because it points you uh, back to the cross. Um, let me try to wrap it up here. Um, Matthew 5, 3, children have sensitive spirits, right? One of the things that God points out in that, 
that, that children have sensitive spirits. Somebody have Matthew 5, 3 there? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this is the Beatitudes. Uh, but one of the things that you find, one of the things that I love, 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 about children is that they haven't become jaded yet. They haven't become skeptical. They haven't become too biased yet. They're still pretty pure. Uh, you ever notice that? Uh, you know what, what I love? We had the wedding yesterday and had a funeral yesterday morning, and you tend to interact with little children sometimes as families come. You go up and say hi to a child, right? And they just say hi back. They don't sit there and go, I don't know. What's in it for me? Right? Or I don't know you. Right? And I know we try to teach them, right? Be careful of strangers. I get that. But don't you understand that that kind of starts to pervert their view of the world? Okay? One of the things that was, we were, uh, we were out riding motorcycles uh, in St. Louis, a bunch of us. We came rolling into this diner and uh, for breakfast, and I don't know, six, ten of us, and, and black leathers and stuff like that, and, and all. And, and we, we probably looked more menacing, obviously, than we were a bunch of Christians riding to breakfast. And uh, there's, this, there's this young mom, and she had three little kids there in this corner booth. And we all come in, we're sitting, we're kind of hooping and hollering and, and just enjoying the world and, and the day. And, and we sit down to start ordering breakfast. And this little kid comes over, he's probably three years old, comes over and he tugs on my, uh, on my leather jacket. And I look over at him and he has a little toy phone, right? And he lifts it up and he says, it's for you. <laughs> I don't care how big and bad you are. When a little four-year-old hands you a toy phone, you answer it. <laughs> and you talk to whoever's on it. Right? I talked to him and I said, who is it? He said, it's Bozo. <laughs> Bozo, how are you? Big smile on his face and so forth. But see, his world is simple. Right? His spirit is pure. I mean, I, you know, I know sin exists and so forth, but it hasn't happened yet. So when we can get children involved in service, that pure spirit, it not only blesses them, I'm telling you folks, it blesses us. When you're able to see them just naturally giving that, it's, it's like those kids, uh, when the kids come and bring mom or grandma a dandelion, they think it's the greatest bouquet ever. And, and you're looking at it kind of going, it's a weed. And it's going to shrivel in like 15 minutes and so forth. And yet they look at it and go, this is the most wonderful gift I could give to this woman that I love. And it, it's no deeper than that. In fact, if it shrivels up in 15 more minutes, you go like, hey, there's a whole bunch in the backyard. I'll just go pick some more. Okay which I try to encourage them. That's a good thing. All right, let's wrap it up. Matthew 5, uh, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? Here's why. That they may see your good deeds, not just your good deeds and pat you on the back and glorify your Father in heaven. See them, see this. Let them see you serving, right? Not for your sake, not to go, boy, am I a great person to serve. But instead, why are you doing this? That's often what people ask. When you serve just out of the blue, somebody's going to ask you, why are you doing this? God loves me, and I just want to share it. That's it. I don't have an agenda. I don't have a track for you. I don't have an invite card. I don't have any of that. I just want to bless you because God has blessed me. And if there's opportunity further on, praise the Lord. But sometimes it's just like God says, if you give a small child a cold glass of water, that seems pretty simple. He says, there's a blessing in there for you. All right, finish it up. Let your light shine before others. Why? Glory to God. That's why we serve, ultimately why we serve, right? And Matthew 5, 16, not only talks about light, but it also talks about salt. Um, we don't have a lot of time to go through this, but you know what salt does to food. It preserves it, it flavors it. Um, did this the other night. I don't usually do this. Uh, we were eating corn on the cob, sweet corn. Okay, some of you are starting to see it in the in the stores again, and uh, just a little bit of butter. Okay, and a little little bit of salt, just a little bit. Right, that seems to be a, a thing for us. And and I tell you, when I eat that, you know what I'm enjoying? I don't sit there and, and take a big bite and go, oh, that is good salt. <laughs> salt brings out the flavor of the food, right? When you and I are salt, you know what we're supposed to bring out? Not the salt, but the one that we are emphasizing, the one that we are drawing attention to. That's God. That's what the red letters are all about. Let's pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the red words. I thank you for the gift and the opportunity to serve. Lord, I really mean that. I thank you for the opportunity because not only does it grow us, but I, we see what it does. It blesses people. 
It blesses them to, to know more about you. Maybe they don't know you by name, but they do get to hear you, feel you, see you in some ways, and that's one step closer to salvation. So Lord, I pray everyone in this room feels that step this coming week, that you use us just to show a kindness, uh, to show a goodness, to show a love to, to someone around us, and, and it's just you through us. That's your intention. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an excellent week. You too.